all the saints, I want to greet you in the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All, all the saints, all the visitors, I want to greet you tonight. Praise God in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Tonight we have a very interesting, in my opinion, subject area to take on tonight. And, you know, but I, I trust that God um, will help us to, I mean, whatever is put together that we will be able to learn from it. So we look at the subject area of victorious Christian living. And I really think it's an interesting subject, amen. And it's something that we can benefit from and learn from. So let me just go right ahead, uh, share my screen in relation to where we're going. Praise God. So again, as I said, I greet you in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise God. And I pray, God, that we will be blessed tonight. Now, let us go right into the, the subject. Praise God. I want us to understand tonight that as we look at the subject of victorious Christian living, amen, I want us to understand that God has put everything in place for us to live a victorious Christian life. Amen. God will not require of us to live victoriously if he had not put everything that we need for us to live that particular way. Amen. So it was Peter who said in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, that according to his divine power, praise God, hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue. Now, when we look at that particular verse, all things refer to various spiritual blessings and benefits um, that is given to us as believers, you know, everything that we need, everything that is necessary for life and for godliness, praise God, we find that we have it in the word of God. Amen. And, and these benefits include stuff like forgiveness of sins. Amen. God is able to, you know, if, if it was a case where, uh, where we fall down, God would have cut us off. Amen. Then all of us here would not be sitting here tonight. But he has given us all things, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, you know, forgiveness of sin, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the assurance that we can have eternal life in him. Amen. The ability to resist temptation and to overcome sin. God has given us all things. This includes stuff like, um, you know, spiritual gifts that is necessary for the church, you know, stuff like wisdom and knowledge and faith and healing and miracles and prophecy, all of these things. God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And, and, I, and it is important that we first grasp that because a lot of people don't realize that once you come into the body of Christ, amen, God would, would have put everything in place. And that's how God has always operated. If you realize in the book of Genesis, before God created man, amen, he created everything, amen, that the man would need. So, for example, he created the, the stars and the moon and he, he created the environment. And then after everything was in place, then he created man. That's how God operates. In a similar way, amen, when we become children of God, God has put everything in place for us to live a victorious Christian life life amen and therefore we have no excuse to live a life that pleases god now another thing i want us to to understand um is that we want to define um what we mean by victory so we're talking about a victorious christian life what do we mean by victory and, and when we talk about victory in the bible what are we talking about so the word victory in the bible is translated from a hebrew word um, Tasha, and the Greek word Neko, and it actually speaks to God's power and protection over his people. So when God gives you victory, you're talking in the context of the, God, the fact that God gives you power, or God's power and protection he has for his people. Um, and God, it also speaks to the fact that God allows us to triumph over good, triumph over evil. So he has given us everything that we need, the victory that we need, amen, based on the very meaning of the word, speaks to the fact that God has given us all the power and protection that we need. Amen. Now, as we, children of God, it's very important that we understand 
couple stuff as it relates to victory. First of all, when we talk about a victorious Christian living, amen, we must first realize that when we talk about victory, we are not fighting for victory. Amen. And I want us to get this. We are not fighting for victory, but we are fighting from victory. There's a difference. We are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. Now, you see the word for, I underlined it because I want us to get the point that for in the English language is a preposition and it speaks to a purpose or intended recipient of an action or object. It, it relates to a period of time or something that should occur. So, for example, I can say I, I prepared for Bible study tonight. Amen. I prepared. I am saving my money for a trip. Amen. I am working on this project for the next month. I am doing this task for you. It indicates a period of time during which something occurs. I want you to get that. So we are not fighting for victory. But the word from is also a preposition in English language, and it indicates a starting point. It talks about an origin. It talks about a source of something. Uh, it talks about a place where something begins. So, for example, I'm saying, I am going to school from my house. Amen. I am starting to work from Monday. It speaks to a, a, a starting point. So, as children of God, we must realize something. We are not fighting in this warfare from or for victory. We are fighting from victory. In other words, we are already victorious in Christ Jesus. We are not fighting for victory, but we are fighting from victory. Now, when you make a statement like this, amen, it is called a, in, in, in mathematics or in, in, in logics, they call it a Proposition, P-R-O, proposition. And a proposition practically is a statement or a sentence that can be ev evaluated to a true or a false premise. So for example, I can say two plus two equal four. That is a proposition because I, it can either be true or it can be false. I can say two plus one equal to four. That also is a proposition because it can be evaluated to true or false. The first statement was a true statement. The second statement was a false statement. Now tonight, I'm telling every child of God, amen, that is on this Bible study tonight, that the proposition that says we are not fighting for victory, but we are fighting from victory is a true statement. And the, the aim of Bible study tonight is how we're talking about victorious Christian living. What does that mean? We are going to examine the whole uh, statement that I've just made. Amen. We're going to evaluate that statement and decide if it is true or it is false. Praise God. Now, there, 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 I did say earlier that God has given us everything that we need in order for us to live a victorious Christian life. And therefore, we're going to look at where God has placed us as children of God, amen, and to see if really we are truly already victorious, amen, in our walk with Christ. And all we need to do is to walk in that victory. Now, let us try to look at some things. Firstly, in order for us to be victorious, I am saying as children of God, I strongly believe that we are a part of, in, of, of an army. We are in an army. The, the, the day you got saved, it's like you, you got enlisted in a warfare. Uh, we are in a spiritual warfare. There's no two ways about that. We all would agree that there are two uh, opposing forces uh, that are that are up diametrically opposed to each other. There's the, the force of good and there's the force of evil. Amen. And it's, it's interesting that we understand as children of God that we, while we are in an, a, a warfare, one of the things that guarantee us that we are going to be victorious is 
who is on our side, or better yet, who is leading our army. Amen. I strongly believe that God has called us as soldiers of the cross. Amen. And when I think about victory, one of the things that often comes to my mind a lot of the time as I thought about the subject, even Monday and Tuesday, is a lot of the fights that were done in the, in, in the Old Testament. So every time I think about the word victorious or victory, what comes to my mind is, is, is like a war, like a fight. Amen. And then I thought about it. Why it is that we have an advantage, amen, over the enemy? Why it is that we have an advantage over the forces of evil? And I am putting it to you tonight that one of the reasons why we are already victorious, and we have to start here, is based on who is actually leading us. That makes a very, very, very uh, important uh, foundation for our victorious living. Who is leading us? So there is a Ghanaian proverb that says an army of sheep led by a lion can defeat an army of lions led by a sheep. Let me say that again. There is a statement that says that an army of sheep led by a lion, can defeat an army of lions led by a sheep. And you might say, how is that possible? Let me tell you what happened. And this was even proven. Um, the, 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 the proverb sounds a little bit observed or contradictory. Um, but the truth be told is that what makes the difference in who wins the fight is who really is leading the fight. Amen. So for example, in, in the 1860s, uh, we find that this same proverb and came come out to be true because there was a war in the United States in the 1860s, the, the, the American Civil War. And it said that the, the South, the, the army that was to the South had some very professional soldiers. They had men that knew how to fight. They had men who were, 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 were experts at doing what they, they did. Amen. But they, they were being led by a guy named Robert E. Lee. You can check it out. Amen. The American Civil War, 1860. Now, Robert E. Lee was not really so much of a fighter. He was, he was not a, uh, an army man in mind. He was more of a gentleman than a general. Amen. And guess what? In the North, so in the South, you had professional soldiers. But who was leading them? Robert E. Lee, who was a gentleman, not really a fighter. But he was there. He was the person who was leading that army in the South. Now, in the North, you had fewer trained soldiers. You had men who were not as skilled as them in the South. Amen. But who was leading them in the North? A guy by the name of General Ulysses Grant. And he, this guy was practically very wise when it come out to warfare. And he was wise when it come out to fighting battles. Now, one would have thought that the army in the South, which had the more skilled soldiers, would have won. But because of the skillfulness of the person who was leading in the North, he was able to lead these set of unskilled, fewer trained soldiers and they won the battle. You can take it out, the American Civil War in the 1860s. So I'm saying to you, one of the reasons why we have the victory and we are coming from a position of victory is because of who is actually leading us. It's a paradox, but who really is leading us? Amen. And without the shadow of a doubt, we fully aware that the quality of an army does not lie really in its manpower but really in its leadership. And the Bible used many verses and passages to reveal the identity of the leader of who the church is. When, you're, when you become a part of the body of Christ, amen, the person who is leading the army, the person who is assuring us that we have the victory is Jesus Christ himself. So for example, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 says, and he, talking about Jesus, is the head of the body, 
the church, praise God, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 to 23 says, And he had put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth in all. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. So what we realize is that the person who is leading the army, amen, is Jesus Christ himself. And because of who is leading the army, then victory is guaranteed to the persons who follow under his leadership. Amen. Again, we look at the fact that many metaphors are used for God towards scripture. And they, these each metaphor will bring out different aspects of the character of God. Amen. You know, for example, the Bible calls him an eagle in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Amen. And the eagle they always use represents God's protection and care for his people. The Bible calls him an ox in Jeremiah chapter I think, 46, 21. And it represents God's strength and power. He's called the Lamb of God in St. John chapter 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. But one of the, the things that jumped out to me is that he is also called the lion. My God, let me go back again. An army of sheep that is led by a lion can defeat an army of lion that is led by a sheep. And God, who is the lion, who is referred to as the lion, amen, will lead us. The use of the metaphor lion in the Bible depicts God's immense strength and power praise god it's a symbol it's a symbol that is commonly associated with power and authority so in many cases we find in scripture where jesus or god is referred to as a lion so for example in isaiah chapter 31 and verse 4 we say for thus hath the lord spoken unto me like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor base himself, amen, for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. So in Isaiah chapter 31, verse 4, the Lord is compared there to a lion. And guess what? This lion is not afraid of the noise made by a group of shepherds. Irrespective of what the enemy comes with, I mean, we have a lion that is leading us who is not afraid. I mean, the verse in Isaiah chapter 31 and verse 4, the Lord of hosts or the Lord of his army is said to come down to fight for Mount Zion. I like the verse which is a symbol in the scripture of Jerusalem and the Jewish people. But the metaphor really emphasizes the strength and the power of the Lord, who is not at all intimidated by those who oppose him. It doesn't matter what the enemy tries. Amen. God is not intimidated by those who come against him. It, the verse also suggests that the Lord will protect and defend his people, just as the land will defend its prey. So here it is that we see Isaiah speaking about Jesus, God the Almighty, as a young lion roaring, amen, as a lion and a young lion roaring on his prey. We also find in Hosea chapter 11, verse 10, that he's also referred to as a lion. Amen. They shall go after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the east. Again, we see, praise God, where Jesus himself, our God, is depicted, praise God, as a lion. Amen. So in Hosea chapter 11, verse 10, the prophet Hosea is speaking about the Israelites here. And let me put it in context. Who had strayed from following the Lord. That's really what was happening. And the verse state that they ultimately returned to the fallen Lord when they, and what did what happen? The Lord roared like a lion. So the image of the lion roaring is one of power and authority. And in this particular context, it suggests to us that the Lord will make his presence known in a powerful way. What am I saying? Is that the, the lion that leads us, amen, when he roars, he makes his presence known in a powerful way. And the next phrase that goes after that says, when he roars, his children shall come trembling, my God, from the west. 
And this, this, this describes the response of the Israelites to the Lord's roar. Amen. The phrase, his children, refers to the Israelites, the Lord's chosen people. And the fact that they come trembling suggests that they will be filled with fear and awe at the Lord's power, but also suggests that they are now repenting and in submission to him. And the West refers to the fact that they are in their exile and such that they will come back to the Lord even from a faraway land. But irrespective of the, the context of Hosea chapter 11, amen, what we find is that the Lord is referred to like a lion, amen, and when he roars, it, it, it depicts his power and his authority. What am I saying, children of God? We are sheep that have been led by a lion, and therefore, based on the fact that who is leading us is a sure guarantee, praise God, that we will have victory, victory. Another thing that we must realize is that he's not just any lion. When we talk about, when the Bible talk about who God is, and when we talk about, and, and, and I soon talk about us coming back to us, leading to us. But I want us to first start from who is leading us so that we can understand clearly as children of God that you have the ability, amen, because of who is in front of us to win the war. He is a lion. And the Bible says in Exodus chapter 15, verse 3, that the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name, my God. So apart from the fact that he is a lion, the Bible said he is a man of war. So we talk about God and who is ahead of us. We're not talking about somebody who is intended to lose. We're talking about somebody who has already won. Praise God. So look at this now. The Bible teaches us that our God is a God of victory. So in the Old Testament, for example, God is this depicted, for example, of leading the Israelites to victory in battle against their enemy. And, and I will see that many times through scripture. For example, Exodus chapter 14, verse 14, God tells Moses, the Lord shall fight for you. So you see why? As why we can't win the battle? Because the Lord shall fight for you. So why you can't live victorious? Because the Lord shall fight for you. And what happened? You shall hold your peace. We find that in the Old Testament. But it is also followed through into the New Testament. Amen. Jesus is portrayed as the ultimate victory over sin and death. To his death and resurrection. Amen. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, Paul writes, but thanks be to God, which giveth us what? Victory. Tell somebody that you can live a victorious life because God has already given us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, there are many other verses that we can think about. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. And the elder said unto me, weep not, read no more, because the, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the school and it's seven seals. He's talking about Jesus Christ himself. And guess what? That is who we have leading us. You are assured of victory. But I want to make a point, a strong point. It relates down to how victorious you are. And why I say that you are already not fighting for victory, but you are fighting from victory. Now look at this verse. There's a verse in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. It says, and having spoiled principalities, and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let me go back in. And having spoiled principalities and powers, praise God, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, it is important that when we look at verses, Praise God. And, and tonight I'm going to pull out a little hermeneutics. So we're going to look at it from a what we call a grammatical, historical perspective. In other words, we want to look, we want to, to, to pull apart this particular verse. We want to dissect it and to get into what the verse is really talking about. So let's look at it from a grammatical, historical perspective. So firstly, from the grammatical perspective, the verse that we just read, praise God, is written in past tense indicating that the action of spoiled, which actually means to disarm, he had made them openly. In other words, spoiled is in the past tense. And he had showed them openly, putting them to open shame. That already has occurred. All of that is already done. 
Amen. Now I'm going to go even deeper. The phrase principles and principalities, sorry, and powers in the Greek refers to spiritual powers such as demons and evil spirits. And they were believed to have authority over the material world in the first century. Now let me let me explain what that means. Now you see, in the Greco Roman society, I mean, they, they, they were polytheistic in their type of belief in their religious system. So they believe that there was a God who controlled various elements. They believe that there was a God who controlled the weather. They believe that there was a God who controlled crops and fertility. And they believe that they had, in a similar way, you had demonic spirits who had control of a specific human life, certain parts of your life. So they, they had control over disease and misfortune. You know, they also believe that the, the natural world was full of unseen forces that could affect human affairs. They believe that these forces could be influenced by supernatural beings, both good and evil. And they could invoke uh, uh, the, this, the ma magics and so on to get these beings and these demons to, to, to operate in a particular way. In other words, these, the, 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 these demons and these evil spirits um, they, 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 they practically had influence and great influence over the material world, over human lives. Um, so that's what they believed. They believed that the power and the authority of demons and evil spirits in the first century world was a reflection of, of what was taking place in their time. They believed that they, they the first set the first century people, Greco-Roman world, believed that. Look here. Um, the, these demons had total authority over the material world. Now, I want you to bear these things in mind. So, firstly, the verse is written in the past tense. You know, action is, is spoiled or he disarmed uh, and, and he did it openly, which means it already occurred. And look at the Greek word for principalities and powers, talking about demons that had control in their minds over the material world. Now, let's go deeper in the grammar. In the verse that we look at, there are two verbs that are used that have great importance. I want to pull them out. The first verb that we just spoke about was spoiled. The word spoil there in the Greek actually means to strip. It means to disarm. It means to make powerless. And the other verb is the practically word talking about making a shoe of them openly. That's, that, that was one uh word in the greek which actually put to open shame that's what it means or to mean to make a public spectacle or to bring to shame or to disgrace now i want you to understand something in the that society in the first century in the greco-roman society when they talk about putting somebody to open shame what actually means it means to is a way of to humiliate or to degrade uh people that you have our armies that you have won in battle so it was it was a form of psychological warfare then the intent was to break the spirit of the defeated enemy and to, to ensure that there was no resistance now what they usually do is that how they, the soldiers would put them to open shame is that they they would catch for example when they go into a place and they win the war i mean sometimes if they did not kill the king or whoever is in charge of the army they would carry them um in back to their camp they would carry them to their camp chained amen and they would actually they would actually put them in that embarrassing position probably undressed they would humiliate them they would they would they would strip them of everything they have and they would lead them and parade them to their town um showing that they have captured this particular army and the people in the streets would something so would sometimes jeer them amen so with, with further humiliate them amen to show that they are already defeated now let's go back again the bible says in in colossians chapter 2 and verse 15 and having spoiled principalities and powers he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. I said it's already gone. But what did Jesus do? When Jesus went to the cross, praise God, uh, what he did on the cross is that, first of all, he disarmed the devil. Amen. Everything, every authority that the devil thought he had. When Jesus was crucified and he died, buried, and he was resurrected, amen, he disarmed 
disarmed the devil. Not only did he dis just disarm the devil, but he put him to open shame in the sense that he, before the whole host of heaven, before every demonic force that exists, we could see the devil and his army on chains. Amen. Being a humiliated state. Amen. And Jesus is saying, I made a state of them openly. So Paul is using the culture that was there in the time to demonstrate to us what God did for us. In other words, there is a psychological uh, disgrace to the enemy. So therefore, this is why when an enemy comes to you and tell you that you cannot live for God, let him understand that you already are a defeated foe. Jesus had already won the battle at Calvary. The crucifixion is seen as an act of triumphant when Jesus publicly defeat the spiritual powers and held humanity in bondage. So everything that the devil thought that he had won when Jesus died on the cross, amen, he gave us the victory. He stripped the devil. He, he disarmed him. He pulled out every power. That is why, if you don't, some of us don't even realize the power that we have. People with the Holy Ghost calling for leadership to come to their house because their house is full of demon powers. What you don't realize is that the devil is already disarmed. And therefore, when you understand that you're coming from a place of victory, you're coming from a place, from a place of victory, and that you're not fighting for victory, you can say it in your house, devil, you have to come out. And the devil have to come out because guess what? He's already in chains. He's already disarmed. He's already humiliated. And Jesus made an open show of him. So we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. Because Jesus has the power to overcome death, hell, and the grave. And every opposing spiritual power have been defeated. My God. I wonder if somebody is happy about that. You already have the victory. Thank you, Holy Ghost. No. I did say that when we got saved, we got enlisted in the army. We are in a spiritual battle. We are in a war fear. We are in a war. And there are a couple of things. So we already understand that we already have the victory. We are already understand that we are coming from a place of victory. But because we exist in time, God has given us some things some tools that shows us, helps us to live a victorious Christian walk. So to live a Christ, victorious Christian life. And we're going to try to examine some of these things. Now, the first one I want to understand is training. Training. Now, as you think about the fact that we are in an army, we have to train. Now, there was a general by the name of George Smith. Peyton. He is a general in the United States Army. Um, he, he, he was a general in the United States Army, sorry. Um, he lived, he was born in November 11, 1885. And to show that he was a very prominent general, a, a, a highly decorated officer in their army. I mean, he, he was one of them who was instrumental in strategic planning for things like in World War II and stuff. And he made a very important quote that I want us to borrow tonight. He says, he who sweats more in training bleeds less in battle. He who sweats more in training bleeds less in battle. The quote is saying that if someone works hard and puts in a lot of effort during their training, they will be better prepared for actual combat and will suffer fewer casualties or injuries. The idea behind the quote is that the more one trains and prepares for difficult situations, the better equipped they will be to handle it when it comes. You ever wonder why, as children of God, some people as little things come in their lives, they walk out because they don't, they, they, they don't realize that, look here, sometimes you need to spend some more time. The more time you spend with God, the more time you spend in training and in the world and so on and so on and so forth, you're going to realize that you're going to be at a better position. You're going to be better equipped uh, to handle 
when situation come. The quote from George S. Patton is advocating for hard work and prepare preparation as a way of increasing one chance of success in difficult or dangerous situations. Now, it's, you must understand, child of God, that once you have become saved, once you have become a child of God, you're going to have situations. It's not going to be a uh, straight niceness. It's not going to be cloud. You're not going to be on cloud, cloud in heaven all the time. In the sense that you're not going to have nice life all the time. You're going to have situations where things are going to seem hard. But we can have the victory by ensuring that we are trained to deal with the situation. So it is really ridiculous, even in the physical, to send a soldier to battle without basic, even basic training. It would be ridiculous and will result obviously in defeat. So the Bible says we must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Remember, I told you now, we are like enlisted in the army. We're talking about victorious Christian work, victorious Christian living. Now, one of the things I am happy for is that it is God, amen, who actually teaches us how to fight. That is why when you become enlisted in the army of God, you submit yourself to him. So David says, look here, bless be the Lord. And he says, I think Psalm 144, the Lord, my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Now, let us just look at this a little bit. The word teacheth in the verse is in the past tense. You know, God, David's hands to war and his fingers to fight. God did not just teach David in the past tense, sorry. Uh, let, let, let me say it again. God did not just teach David hands to war and fingers to fight. And, and if I say he teach, that would be past tense. But David used the, what we call the present continuous tense. That's the term. So when you say teacheth, it's in the present continuous tense. Because as long as you are in the Lord's army, you are always learning. He is teaching us every single day how to war. I'm going to look at this as we go through and show you that, look here, to become victorious in our Christian work, we're going to realize that every single day, the situations that you come upon, the hard times, the struggles, the, the, the backbite and whatever it is that reach you at different points in your life, you're going to realize that it was always, as long as you have been submitted to God, you're going to realize that it was the Lord who was teaching you your hands to war and your fingers to fight. Praise God. Amen. God did not teach you one day and leave you, but your teaching is progressive. Your teaching is continuous. Just like I spoke about spiritual maturity, which is continuous in a similar way. Amen. God is teaching or teacheth, which is the present continuous tense, your hands to war and your fingers to fight. Now, there are certain areas, and the truth be told, we, 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 if we should go through every single area where we were learning, we would have we would have not ended the lesson tonight. But there are three basic areas of training that I think is very important for every child of God. One, you must gain knowledge and understanding of the word. Number two, you must have self-discipline. And number three, you must learn to interact with the rest of the body of Christ. So the first area that guarantees that we have victory is our training. How you are trained. And who is training you? God. Michael, Jesus himself. So we gain knowledge and understand the word. This is like the foundation of the Christian training. This is the foundation of you being guaranteed victory. So Christians might study the Bible on their own or in a group setting or you go to Bible school or you come to Bible study. But the goal of you looking into the perfect law of liberty is that you can understand what the word of God is saying and that you're able to apply it to your daily lives. So we're going to look more at these things, but our first era of training is that we must gain knowledge and understanding of the word. Never be satisfied with where you are in the world. It doesn't matter how much things you think you know. Amen. There is always 
further to go. It doesn't matter how much things you think you have learned over the years. The word of God is alive. It's a living book. Amen. And guess what? It is God himself. And one of the things we learn about God is that God is infinite. Amen. Talking about your, your infinity means there is no beginning or ending, which means that once you are in the book, you are ever learning, ever learning, ever learning, ever growing in God. The second training area is that is of self-discipline. Once you get enlisted, amen, in the body of Christ, in the army of the Lord, you have to have self-discipline. Many Christians believe that developing self-control and self-discipline is an important part of their spiritual training. You must get that. And this includes stuff like fasting. Amen. Fasting. Do you fast like once a week? Do you fast like uh, three, three days every quarter? Whatever it is. But there have to be a season of fasting and praying and meditating. And, I, and I'm jumping over this because they are, they are, I'm going to go a little deeper in some of these things. So praying and fasting and meditating and setting boundaries. You have to have these things, self-discipline. That's a part of your training. Amen. So you have to, one, get a knowledge and understand of the word. And through that, you develop self-discipline by learning how to fast and how to pray. And if you don't know how to fast, you can reach out to your pastor and ask him how to help you. If you can do a six to six, they can do a full day. They can do two days, but you learn. You learn how to meditate because it's not just reading the word. Sometimes you have to sit down and let God speak to you. I'm going to talk about that and set boundaries for yourself as a child of God. Amen. Amen. You have to set boundaries. If you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. Praise God. You have to set boundaries as a child of God. And thirdly, you learn how to interact with the rest of the body of Christ. Now, one way we learn this, praise God, is to is by participating in church activities. Now, I always tell people it's very important as children of God that we become a part of what is taking place in church. Talking about victorious Christian living, you have to be involved. You can't come to church for 10 years and you're involved in no ministry. You come to church every single Sunday and you get involved in nothing. You're not involved in home Bible study. You're not involved in, in house to house. You're not involved in, in, in nothing at all. You do nothing. You come to church and every day you're being fed and you're not giving back anything. You know what I mean? You're not learning from your training. Your training is supposed to equip you, amen, to, to be able to impart to others. And therefore, one of the ways that you can learn and to grow in your training session is to be involved in what other people are doing. Amen. So what we usually do, is that if we go to house to house or home Bible study, we have so many new converts. Like if I'm going home Bible study, I probably carry two new converts with me. So they learn what to do, what not to do. Amen. In, and they learn these things. They get involved in stuff like the choir ministry. They get involved in stuff like, and you get involved in these things because it's a part of your training. Let me go back at the quote again. The quote says, he who sweats more in training bleeds less in battle. So when you spend time in the word, when you spend time having self-discipline like the fasting and praying and, and meditating and so on, and when you learn to interact with the rest of the body of Christ, you're going to realize that you're, it, it is harder for you to fall. Now, apart from the fact that you are training, when you are training, God not only does train you and leave you up, but he has given you weapons that are very powerful for your warfare. You know, uh, one of, the, one of the, the factors that determine if an army is going to win, in many cases, is depending on the, 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 the weapons that they have in their, in, in, in their collection, the weapons that they have uh, together. And therefore, the Bible, Jesus himself, apart from the fact that he leads us, apart from the fact that he's ahead of us and he wins the battle for us, apart from the fact that we have to be involved in training, he has also equipped us with weapons. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strong hole. The quote is, is Paul was writing to the church at Corinth. And Paul is discussing spiritual battle, talking about which engaging in battle and warfare. And he's emphasizing the fact that the weapons that we use in the battle are not physical weapons, amen, but rather they are spiritual in nature. And it's very important that we understand that. If some of us grasp this concept, then we will get in lotless trouble. We have spiritual weapons 
The phrase divine power refers to the power of God, which is able to overcome any obstacle of the strong of the enemy, any obstacle of the devil. We are able to defeat every spiritual enemy. Amen. And guess what? We do this by not relying on our own ability or strength because the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. That is why when you understand where, where your weapon really lies in and who your weapon is, then you start to realize that, okay, then truly Jesus Christ, all the weaponry lies within him. That is why in Jude chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible said, Michael, the archangel, when he was contending with the devil over the body of Moses, the Bible said he brought no uh, real accusation against the devil. But he just say, the Lord rebuke you. In other words, he appealed to an authority that was higher than himself. Amen. Now, there are many things I could go into angelology and tell you what this means. But the what stood out the most to me was that he was able to use weaponry of who the Lord is. The Lord rebuke you. Sometimes we need to understand that our weaponry is not physical weapons. Some of us cuss too much, argue too much, when we should be praying more. Amen. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. Now, let's look at some of the weapons that God has given to us. I'm so for in the verse, Paul is encouraging the Corinthians to rely on spiritual weapons rather than flesh weapons to defeat their enemy. And the word stronghold refers to strongholds of the mind where people can hold on to false beliefs and attitudes. So the weapons of our warfare and are mighty good to pull down of strongholds. There are some things that would come to your mind that would keep you in a place that, look here, God can't do this. It can't happen. It never happen. But the weapons that we have in God can pull down the strongholds of the mind, the false beliefs and the false attitudes and the wrong attitudes. The weapons of our warfare helps us to overcome that and to walk victoriously. So the weapons of warfare are key tools that believers can use to defend themselves against spiritual attack of the devil, to resist the temptation of the world, and to live, brethren, a victorious Christian life. Now let us look, I mentioned before, at some of the warfare weapons that God has given to us. One again, we'll go back again to the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the divine of son of soul and spirit and of joints and marrows, and is a desert of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Now, Bishop Daly always tell us in our Bible study about the two-edged sword. And I think he preached that at Bethel. I won't go over it here. But practically, it was a special type of sword that when it goes in, it does two things. It cuts on two sides. Amen. And it was, it, it was developed by the Romans. It was a special type of sword. That, that did extreme damage. That's what you do when you have the word of God. That is why when the devil came to Jesus, he could say, it is written. What he was he doing? He was pushing in the sword. Another thing is that, another weapon that we have is faith. So, so we walk by faith, not by sight. You know, tell me something. When you have faith in God, amen, it means that irrespective of how the situation looks, I am trusting God that God is going to bring me through. That's what the Bible says, the just walks by faith and not by sight. In other words, it's not what I see. It's not how it looks. I mean, it's what God says. It's not what the, it, it, the situation looks. It's what God says. And that's where it's, it's very important that we understand what God says. I'm going to talk about that. Then we talk about the armor of God, which is another weapon. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil or the wiles of the devil. Amen. I will know that scripture well. So we try to go into all of that. But we know that each armory, praise God, is was developed, amen, so that we can have the victory over the enemy. The breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the, the shield of faith, the, 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 the your, 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 your loins girded about with truth. You, you have on the, 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 the shoes of peace, amen. Are, are your feet preparation, prepared, um, set with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Talk about the sword of the spirit. And all of these things, uh, are used, are given to the child of God as weaponry for us to overcome the enemy. Now, there's a weapon that we don't realize how, how very, very important it is. So I run through this because of time, but I want to spend a little time on weapon number four. Now, weapon number four is prayer. We're talking about victorious Christian walk. What prayer is a weapon that you, if you get into prayer, then you would 
you, you, would, you, you, you wouldn't even begin to understand the things that, the victories that you would have in God. Now, there's an article that I read uh, about an American soldier. And he said the most important tool he had while he was at war in Afghanistan was not really his God. His God was important. Yeah. It was not his, it was not his, 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 his tank or whatever. What the most, one of the most important tool to him was his radio. You know, so I put a radio on the screen. Why? Clear exchange of information is vital to any successful military operation. So there's a saying in the military that says, knowing is half the battle. So we need to understand in this warfare that the devil's aim is to get you to really to stop listening to the voice of God. Because he knows that once you know, as, this, as the soldier said, when he was in Afghanistan, he could have communicated with the commander in chief who had an eye on what was taking place and who was where and who was located where. And therefore, one of the things that the devil tried to do in this season is to get us at a place where we stop listening to the voice of God. If the devil can get you to stop hearing the voice of your commander in chief, which is God, then guess what, brethren? You have lost the battle. Let me say that again. If the devil can get you to stop listening or hearing the voice of your commander in chief, then you have already lost the battle. Now, before I continue on this communication thing, let me just tell you how powerful prayer is. Prayer brings blessing. Prayer permits us to enter the treasure house of God and live with an inexhaustible richness of God's power, comfort, and assurance. Prayer is the best response to our problems. Prayer gives us lessons in the Holy Ghost. Prayer girds human uh, weakness with divine strength. Prayer turns human folly into heavenly wisdom. Prayer gives the troubled mortals the peace of God. Prayer is the slender nerve that moved the muscle of omnipotence. I think it was Charles, I think it was Spurgeon who said that. Prayer opens our ears to hear the words of the omniscient, my God. Prayer wraps us in the arms of the omnibenevolent. In other words, when we pray, there is some things that come to your life that will blow your mind. So in order for you to have a victorious Christian walk, one of the tools that we have is the tool of prayer. One of the weapons that we have is the weapon of prayer. So Jesus said, may not always to pray and not to faint. Now, why it is important that we pray? Because as I said before, communication is very important in war. So as I was thinking about this particular study, my mind went back to 2 Chronicles 20, verse 1 to 30. And I won't read all of it. Now we're going to look at from verse 1 to 4. It says, it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them beside the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, a great multitude is come against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazan Tamar, which is En Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast toward all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. In other words, there had to be a communication between, praise God, us and base. The psalmist put it this way, send help from the sanctuary. In other words, you have to be in a position that when the enemy surrounds you, like what happened here in 2 Chronicles 20, amen, even though it can be a fearful situation for us, like it was for Jehoshaphat, praise God, we can seek help from the Lord. We can find a place of prayer. Now, I want you to understand that communication, when I talk about communicating as a weapon, 
we normally communicate from a place called there. I will say there, but that's what the Bible often referred to it. The Bible record is filled with accounts of how God directed specific people to a particular location for spiritual purposes. So for example, God told Ezekiel to arise and go to a plane and he would talk with him where? There. Amen. God uh, told Jeremiah to go to the potter's house and there God would cause him to hear his words. God told Elijah that he was going to the widow of, of Zeph Zerophath and there God would sustain him. That is in 1 Kings 17, 9. Jacob was instructed to go to Egypt and there God would provide for him during the famine. Moses was told to come to the mount and there God would give him the law. It was there on Mount Zion that the Lord commanded blessing according to Psalm 133 verse 3. And there are many other verses that we can talk about. Amen. We talk about there. But the important point is Jehoshaphat, when he realized that the armies were coming against him, he may not appeal to God from a physical location. The Bible said what he did. He stood before the temple in the presence of the Lord where God had placed his name. So in other words, he went to the location. He went to the house of God. He went to where God's presence was. He went to the place where God placed his name. And it was from that location that he sought the Lord. You can look for it again in 2 Chronicles 20. That was that this place, that their place that he sought God. Now the question is, where is your there? Amen. Is it a case where as a soldier in the army, amen, that you don't have a place, a place where you can talk to God? Is there a you, do you have a special place? So we must stand in the presence of the Lord and make our appeal with confidence and he will hear and answer. There must be a place. But let me help you with that. Because a lot of us will probably think that the, the there for us in this season is, 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 is a physical place. But let us try to bring up this point to show you that you have the victory. Did you know, brothers and sisters, that your temple that you are the temple of God. And the spirit of God dwell in you. Notice Jehoshaphat went to the temple where God's name was. Amen. And was from there he spoke to God. In our context, our temple, our body is the temple of God where the spirit of God dwell. So as the temple of God, your spiritual being is inhabited by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? In other words, praise God. Your inner being is where you stand up against the enemy. In other words, when you got the Holy Ghost and God come to live inside of you, it's from that place, that Holy Ghost place. That's why Paul talked about praying in the Holy Ghost. Where does the Holy Ghost dwell? Inside of you. The spirit man that is regenerated by the Holy Spirit through the born again experience. As long as you allow the enemy to threaten and intimidate you, he will do it. So that's why Paul said, give no place to the devil because he knew whenever you give place to Satan, he will always take it. But guess what? There is a place there you're being where the Holy Ghost dwell, where you can communicate and you can talk to God. Now, there is a thing about communication that we must understand too. Because a lot of us, when we talk to God, we pray we spend a lot of times in prayer and we talk to God about who want to walk right, who want to live right, who want God to guide us and to move us in a particular direction, but we don't spend time to move into another part of the weapon. If you can't hear the voice of your commander in chief, we said again, you have lost the battle. So in other words, when Jehoshaphat prayed to God, amen, he didn't just pray, but he had to have a point in time where he stopped and he listened. So when you radio out as an army man, listen for the response. Mm. So the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 20, 14 to 18, then the spirit of the Lord, way down, came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Methaniah, the Levite, the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the congregation. He said, listen, all you of Judah and you have had tons of Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat, Thus saith the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismay because of the great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up against you, uh, come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, 
Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them. For the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiped the Lord. Now, why did I bring this point? Note the response came to Jehazel. Who is Jehazel? Jehazel was only mentioned one time in scripture. Only one time. Yet the message that he brought impacted the destination or the destiny of an entire nation. What am I saying? When you speak and you pray, expect that the answer can come from anywhere. Amen. Probably you would have thought that the answer would have come from one of the prophets. Probably you would have thought that the answer would have come from somebody else. But sometimes when you pray, you have to be open to who God is going to bring the answer through. You know, sometimes God wants to speak to us. And a 12-year-old can go up on your pulpit and preach a word. And that word is for you. It came from God. But because it came from a 12-year-old, some of us think with, with scared regard. Amen. Because it's a young man, we think that it's not. But guess what? We have to be willing to pray. I must be willing to listen and to understand that when God speaks, our we have when we radio in, we must be now open to realize that God can send the channel. We have to be on the right frequency with Him to understand when that message comes back into our radio that this is our commander in chief. His words were pregnant with the potential of a turning point in Israel's circumstance, but to accept. His message, God's people must reject carnal reasoning for divine revelation. Let me say it again. God's people must reject carnal reasoning, which means that carnal reasoning means that the message can only come, amen, through elder or through, no. God might use that sister in the church, amen, that is cleaning the benches. But guess what? Because that sister is cleaning the bench, you think that God can't speak. But guess what? Our ears must be open. Sometimes we have to stop and listen. God, speak to me. I must be willing to get the message and accept the message. It's important to listen so you know where and when to move. So when Jehazel came with the word, the name was never mentioned before. I've searched scriptures before, after, nothing about Jehazel. This one time, this young man name come up. And what did he say? He says, tomorrow, go down against them. He gave an instruction. When you don't know what to do, don't do anything until you do know what to do and then act in God's timing. So it's important to listen, talking about victorious Christian work, talking about praying, talking about radioing in. And when you don't know what to do, listen and wait for the response. I saw this thing on Facebook where a guy was saying, as long as a believer just move and it's an, God is always no, no. God is not always just no, no, no. God exists in, 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 in infinity and eternity. Listen for when God tell you to move. God's word indicates that spiritual victories come to those who learn to wait on him. God, I am stuck in this situation. I have sent to you for help. And now I am waiting for a response from you. Psalms 27 verse 4 says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he what shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now I shut the door of the ark at a specific time, but commanded by God. Amen. Uh, you, you, your timing is important. The death angel passed over Egypt at a set time. Jesus was born when the fullness of time came. So carnal reasoning Always dictate yes. It have to happen. No, no, no. You better somehow. It have to happen. No, God. Tomorrow will be too late. But the Bible says in Isaiah chapter forty, verse thirty-one. But those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. I wonder if somebody could type wait. Wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Tell somebody to wait. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 49, 23, then you will know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. Sometimes what has happened is that we move out of turn, not realizing that victorious Christian walk means that our eyes is on our commander in chief. We are radioing in for help. He's, and we are waiting on his response. Psalms 130 verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his words, I do hope. Tell somebody to wait. Pool number three, discipline, focus, and reliance. 
The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, 4, no man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. Amen. In other words, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. Since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. That's what the verb back the Bible said. Another translation. This verse can be interpreted as a reminder to say, focus and dedicated should be our should be on the one who has called us, our commander in chief. Amen. We must have discipline and self-control in living a meaningful and a fulfilled Christian life. So Paul here is using a metaphor of a soldier to illustrate the importance of discipline and focus for a believer. And the, the verb there, entangled, is in the present tense, an active voice indicating that it's something that someone does currently and he is doing it actively. Amen. So if you look back at the verse again, amen, no one that war it entangled. Amen. It's, it, it, in other words, it's, it, if you're in war, you're not going to get involved in the things of the world. Amen. These things are not going to move you. NIV verse puts it like this. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. Praise God. But rather tries to please his commanding officer. Amen. You know what the problem is? I believe in this, this, this time, most of us are trying to please ourselves. That's why we have a lot of problems today. Amen. With young people. That's why we have a lot of problems even with old people because we are living in an age where it's all about me and myself and I'm trying to please me. I must be happy. I must do this. It's about self-love and offend and, and, and how I feel about a situation. Amen. Feelings tend to be the thing that runs the situations now. But no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. But rather he tries to please who? His commanding officer. My God. The commanding officer is, a, is in the singular, if you look at it in the NIV, indicating that he is speaking of one specific person. In other words, when you become the victorious Christian life, your commanding officer is God. He's the one you are trying to please. But as encouraging Timothy to stay focused on pleasing his commanding officer, meaning God, and not getting caught up in the distractions of everyday life. Who can be seen as a civilian affair. Amen. That's what the soldiers do. As soldiers, we see this present life as trans, uh, transitory. In other words, we're, we're just passing through. We are not citizens of this world and certainly not civilians. We are warriors in the kingdom of God. We are fighters. Amen. We are living a victorious life and our eyes is set on him. And therefore, our aim and our discipline and our focus and our reliance must be on him. Now, you might ask me why I add reliance here because if you go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Joseph had declared something that I want to pull out also. He says, for we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. No, we don't, no, we don't know what to do. Sometimes, as children of God, we really don't know what to do. Situations come, we don't know where to go. But guess what? Because our reliance and our discipline and our training and our focus says we have to be in uh, contact with base at all times. I mean, I'm in this war, but I'm not in this war alone. There is somebody who is leading the warfare. There's somebody that's going to ensure that I get the victory. And therefore, my eyes have to be upon him. My ears have to be open to what he has to say. Amen. I have to move when he tells me to move. I have to, when the cloud gets up and decides to move, that's the time I move. I move with the cloud. Praise God. Because my eyes are upon him. Now, notice if you look at the verse in 2 Chronicles, no mention is made of Jehoshaphat calling upon the military, although he had a great army at the time. Instead of summoning his army, he declared his complete dependence on God. So 18 times in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we see the word thou, we see the word thy, we see the word thee in his prayer, changing his focus from the problem to the solution, from me to thee, from me to thee. God is not about me. Christian, victorious Christian walk has to do with him. I said it, I started there, all about him, not me, him. Now, we're coming down. Number thing, we have to position ourselves for victory. Second Chronicles 20, 17 says, you shall not need fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord. When things happen, we have to know how to position ourselves. How do we position ourselves? The Bible says, out of the mouth of babes and suckling has thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. In other words, 
in, in order for us to live a walk, a, Christ, a victorious Christian walk, we have to put ourselves in a position of victory in the sense that in our minds, we already know we are coming from a place of victory. So from that place of victory is where we're going to operate. We engage the kingdom of darkness when we position ourselves in praise and worship. In other words, whatever comes my way, I'm already a victor. Praise, brethren, is an incredibly powerful tool as it creates a strong defense against one adversary. Amen. How does positioning yourself in praise establish a stronghold? Let me explain that before I move on. In those old time days, it is said that when an army comes up against a city, if the city has a wall around it, it is considered to be a stronghold against the enemy. That's why it's important that you have a, the, the walls were very important in those ancient days. Amen. The greater the wall, the stronger the wall, the more defense you have against the enemy. Now, you have to understand something. The Bible says in Psalm 22, verse 3, that God inhabits the praises of his people. When we praise God, what we do is like God coming down and surrounding his people. It's like God uh, setting a wall around his people. When we praise God, brethren, the presence of God comes down and surrounds us. And the Hebrew word Shekinah means dwelling or settling. So in other words, we set up a stronghold against the enemy when we praise God, because if God comes down and surrounds us, just like a wall would surround a city, praise God, against the enemy, what you have done is that when the enemy comes to attack you, what he is seeing, brethren, is the wall. Now, what is the wall? The wall is the presence of God, the Shekinah Basa, the Shekinah presence of God that dwells around you, praise God, and gives you protection against the wilds of the enemy. Can somebody begin to really praise God? Because guess what? God dwells. God inhabits the praise of his people. When we praise God, it's like the city walls in the Bible. The Shekinah glory of God, the almighty God surrounds you. As the mountains are around about Jerusalem, so the Lord is around about his people. When we praise God, when we praise God, the presence of God comes down. The Shekinah presence of God. You are, you are, you are positioning yourself for victory. Thank you, thank you Holy Ghost. Another thing that the Bible says was clap your hands, all ye people, and shout to God with the voice of triumph. When you come to church on a Sunday, you are positioning yourself. You're, you're living a victorious Christian walk. Uh, 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 you are positioning yourself for victory. Now, the word clap in the Hebrew is talk, it's not just talking about putting your hands together and making a soul. No, clap comes from a Hebrew word, which means to, to drive a weapon. It means to give a blast or a blow. In other words, when you begin to come to church and you shout and you clap your hand and you praise God, I mean, every time you clap your hand, put your hand together for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you are sending blows, you're sending blasts against the enemy. When you praise God, you're setting up stronghold. So when the enemy comes in like a flood, praise God, the Holy Ghost lifts the standard of victory lies, brethren, in our weaponizing our worship against the enemy. The weapons of our warfare, brethren, are not carnal. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. I'm here to tell somebody in closing that we are more than conquerors. Talking about a victorious Christian living. So the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spirit at his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall we? He, not with him, also freely give us all things. I like a verse. In other words, what the verse there is saying is that if God was willing to give up his son, if God was willing to wait that God was in Christ, reconcile the world to himself, if God was willing to come and to die for you, if he was willing to give that up, what else God would give up for you? That means that you are really more than conqueror. If the ultimate thing, his life, was able to enroll himself in flesh and die for you, if we give everything else, you will freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything against the charge of God's elect? If it is God that justified, who is he that condemned it? It is God that died, yea, rather that he rise again. Who is even at the right hand of God? No, Jesus is at the power of God, who also make intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things. In other words, it doesn't matter what comes your way. 
It doesn't matter what happened. We are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. In all these things, we are more than conquerors to him that love us. For I am persuaded. In other words, Paul is convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us. My God, I'm always with my commander in chief and he's with me. He's leading me. Nothing shall separate from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul argues that if God is willing to make such a sacrifice, dying on the cross, he will give us all things to the believers. Amen. Nothing can separate us. Paul concludes by saying he's persuaded that nothing can separate the believer from the love of God. A knowledge that believers are more than conquerors. You can have a victorious Christian walk. You can live a victorious Christian life when you understand who you are, understand who is leading you, understand the training, you understand the weaponry, you understand where God has placed you, understand that he has given you all things. Amen. In conclusion, victorious Christian living is about living a life that is fully surrendered to God and empowered by his spirit. In other words, you can only live this victorious life when you are fully surrendered, when you understand that you're in an army, and I'm working with you and you're working with me. Amen. And we're working together. But we are, we are listening to the voice of God. We are sending requests to base. And base is sending back answer to us. Amen. And irrespective of what the enemy comes with, you already know. Like Elisha. Amen. As he was in that place. And he wonder how is it that he was knowing everything that the king was saying. Because somebody was communicating with God and God was responding. Amen. He has empowered us by his spirit. It requires consistent effort to grow our relationship with God. And it's a life of faith. It's a life of obedience and it's a life of service. Amen. In conclusion, victorious Christian living, as I said before, is living a life that really pleases him. Living a life that really pleases him. And I pray, God, that tonight as I close, that we understand that where we are in God and what we have in God, we are already victorious. We are not, we are not trying to live for victory. We're not talking about a Christian Christian life or living a Christian life for, we're not working for it, we're working from it because God has already given us the victory. Let's pray. Great God, we, we exalt you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your grace. We thank you, Lord, for your presence, God, we feel tonight. You said how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I pray, God, that you'll help us, God, that we might be on one accord. And that what was said tonight, God, I will hide in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Help us, Lord Jesus, to realize that we already have the victory in Jesus. When you died on the cross, amen. When you, when you, when, when the nails went to your hands and your and your feet, God, when they put that thorn, uh, God, and blood flow, God Jesus, that we have victory through the blood of Jesus Christ. Help us to realize, God Jesus, that hallelujah, that. The fight, the fight is already fixed in you and you're already at a place, God, of victory. Help us, Lord, just to walk, God, the way we ought to walk and talk, God, as the way we ought to talk. Help us, Lord, not to be entangled, uh, God, with the fears of this life, but help us, Lord, to realize that we are warriors, that we are soldiers of the cross. And therefore, God, our focus should be on our commander in chief. And be at any time ready uh, to depart this earth. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, you'll continue to bless, continue to bless every saint. Praise God. Even visitors who have come to this session tonight, because you'll bless them. Oh God, those who don't have the Holy Ghost, say, God said, no man can come to God except your spirit draw them, pull them by your spirit and to realize, oh God, that if they're outside of you, then they're living a dangerous life. Oh God, I pray right now in this season that you'll continue to keep us, the body of Christ. Oh God, that you might be ready. You said in your words that you're coming back for a church that you don't spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that we should be blamed Bless. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, continue Lord to wash us and to purge us and to make us who we are to be as we grow, God, in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord. Oh God, as we uh, thank you, God, for what was delivered tonight. Thank you, Lord, for speaking and for using me as a vessel, oh God, for your purpose and for your glory. Let your name alone be glorified and not another. You must increase and we must decrease as we look to you who is the author and the finish of our faith. We give you thanks. We give you glory. We give you honor as due to your matchless name, the name of Jesus. Thank you one more time. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Amen.